have to tell you, this is my swan song. By the time the end of this year, uh, my daughter's a junior, and she'll be senior next year. By the end of this year, I will have been on the board 10 years, which means it's time to go. And so this is the last time I'm gonna get up and speak in front of you for one of these. It'll be somebody else next year. And I was thinking a lot, um, starting about June, end of the year, praying about this coming year and what God wanted to accomplish. And we had a board, a mini board retreat a couple of weekends ago. And as I began talking, they all started talking about the same word. And that was my confirmation about what God wanted to accomplish in us and through us and what he wanted me to talk to you about. And when I was in college, I went to college in the late 80s, I remember going through my education classes and I was near the end of everything. And I remember being in this one class and I was at K-12 music education, um, Latin came later. And I remember this professor saying, well, you have to let the kids, oh guys, if you want, if you don't want to stand, there's chairs upstairs, just so you know, you can go up in the balcony, you can totally stand if you'd like. But, and this one educator said, well, you know, you, you can't tell kids what's right and wrong. And I went, what? <laughs> no, you can't tell what kids right and wrong. They have to discover what the truth is for themselves. And I'm thinking, what the heck? <laughs> they're elementary students, and I'm going to be a music teacher. What do you mean there's no right and wrong? And they're like, no, no, you can't. Kids need to discover it on their own. And what's right for them and what's true for them may not be true for somebody else. And I went, what? There's no universal truth? That's relativism. That was kind of the, it's been around for a long time, but that's really sort of when it started to creep, creep into the schools. And I said, I can't do that. I cannot teach in a public school if you're going to tell me that I can't tell kids what is truth and what is not truth. So, and I realized then that truth is one of my core values. And it's how I grew up. My, my younger sister will tell you, my younger sister was a liar. Massive liar. <laughs> She was. She stole stuff. She's 11 years younger than I am. She lied a lot, but truth was important to me. My parents used to send me to her because she would lie to their faces and never going to admit. My sister couldn't lie to me. To this day, she can't lie to me. I'll ask her something, and when she was little, she'd be like, she, she'd learn. She finally started fessing up of like when I walked into the room because she knew that she couldn't lie to me. Truth is, it is really important to me, and over the last couple of years, I've seen a growing lack of structure everywhere. I see it at home. I see it in churches. I see it in schools, especially. I see it in work. The problem with a lack of structure is that things that were previously held to be true suddenly are considered flexible. And any good teacher that you know, any good teacher, the ones here will tell you that children crave structure. And if they don't have structure and they don't have boundaries, they don't feel safe in a classroom because they don't know what to expect because everything's flexible. So children who don't feel safe can't learn and grow. Structure is important. And so here's the first truth. Our kids are struggling with their identities. Even if you think your child is fine or not, or is not affected by what's happening in the world, they are not fine. I thought my sister, my youngest daughter was well adjusted, happy, and I'm starting to talk to her about this stuff, and she's like, yep, yep. And I'm like, I couldn't tell that she wasn't fine until I sat down and asked her. So this is not a problem unique to connections. We see it played out everywhere, and I think some places even more then you see it here. So our kids are being told by the world that they can have an Insta identity. And that, that if the Insta identity they've chosen that day doesn't feel right, they can should and do should keep changing it as often as they wish. This is not true. Do you remember middle school? Think for a minute, cringe a little bit. Do you remember what started happening in middle school? It was the struggle for identity, to figure out who you were. And guess what? That is completely normal. It's, a smooth, it's not a smooth process, and it takes a lifetime to figure out. I'm 53, 
and I still don't have it figured out. And I imagine that I won't have it figured out until I see Jesus face to face. So here's another truth. Our parenting, the parenting that's modeled for us affects how we parent. Um, before I came here, I had a kinder music studio. It was the largest in the world at the time. I had over a thousand families. And I remember uh, watching these moms come in. And they come in with their first child and they were stay-at-home moms and everything was going great. And then they had a second child and they're like, we're, we're dropping class. I'd be like, why? They're like, we can't get two kids in the car. And I'm like, sure you do. You pick one up, you put it in, and you buckle them, and you pick the other one up, and you buckle them. They literally could, didn't know how to get two kids in the car. And the more that my teachers and I talked about what was going on, what we had realized was this was a whole generation of moms that had been raised in daycare. They never saw parenting modeled. They didn't know how to do it. And so what we did is we ended up having to teach them how to parent. They were moms that would have um, au pairs. They were stay-at-home moms with au pairs or nannies because, or they'd send their 18 months old off to, they call it school, but it wasn't really school, it was daycare because they didn't know what to do. So the world right now, there's no model for this. It's like parenting in the wild west. And the issues that our parents dealt with are nothing like the issues that we're dealing with. Anxiety was already an epidemic before COVID. And I've got some stats for you. About almost 10 years ago, a psychologist named Robert Leahy pointed out the average high school kid, this is 10 years ago, today has the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the early 1950s. Since COVID, it's gotten significantly worse. And the younger generations are significantly more affected than the older generations. I heard my pastor say this. He's like, if you're over 60, it's like you grew up on a different planet. And one third of teenagers have clinically significant levels of anxiety. And the majority of the next generation is going to be treated for anxiety disorders in their lifetime. 48% of 18 to 25 year olds are reporting mental health problems. And generalized anxiety and depressive disorders have more than doubled in youth since the pandemic started. If you think your kids are fine, they're not. This is what we're facing. This is where, and, and there's, no, there's no book for this. There's, there's nobody that's come before us and say, okay, this is how we help our kids. Truth. We can see where the world is going but we don't have to end up in the same place. Truth, Psalm 127.3 says, children are an inheritance from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Amen. Truth, John 10.10 10 says, that the thief who is Satan comes only to steal and kill and destroy. John 8.44 says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with truth because there is no truth in him. He is a liar and a father of lies. Truth. Matthew 28 tells us that Jesus took Satan's authority away from him. We know from Ephesians 1 that God seated Christ at the right hand, his right hand in heaven, and he put everybody, everything under his feet meaning that Jesus has authority over everything. And then in chapter 2, do you know what it says? God takes us and puts us at the right hand of Jesus. So where is everything? Under our feet. Truth. It's time to go to battle for our kids and contend for our inheritance. Don't let anybody take that away from you. And we have the God-given power and authority to do so. Truth. An institution cannot do this, but people can. The vision of Connections is to help launch well-prepared young adults who pursue Christ and courageously impact their world. Connections, the institution does that by partnering with parents to educate them and equip them. So rather than running from conflict or falling prey to deceit and manipulation, they can respond with confidence and biblical truth when the world bombards them with lies. We've only got 18 years to do that, people. Right? 
We want students to be strong enough in their relationship with God to navigate this next phase of their lives. Connections is not meant to be a bubble. That's impossible. We cannot protect our kids. Maybe in the middle of Alaska somewhere, <laughs> right? And, 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 and I, even then, I don't know. The kids have gotten so much access. Their authority has been TikTok and YouTube. They haven't had those connections during COVID. It was one of the reasons I wanted to keep connections open because I wanted them to be able to be with us and be with each other. But although, but connections does have a clear statement of faith and beliefs. But why, and so my kids are here. A lot of you are here. I've heard from a lot of parents, especially the younger kids, that the reason they want to homeschool them is they want to protect them from what's going on in public schools. That's awesome. I applaud that. I totally support that. But while you protect, you must also equip. 80% of children who grow up going to church walk away from the church forever after they graduate high school. Not making that up, people. I grew up in a no sugar household, like literally no sugar. We had the horrible things like carob and you know, <laughs> sprouts and like not even the good stuff. No, like it's so much better stuff to eat, you know? And uh, okay, I'm gonna tell you a story. Richard Pritchard, my boyfriend in third grade. I wasn't allowed to have sugar at all. Nobody ever told me why. Like, maybe I wouldn't have believed them when I was in first grade, but sugar's bad for your body, right? But I remember in third grade, they had penny candy. Do you guys remember penny candy? Every, these pieces of candy were, oh, I gave Richard Pritchard a dollar. And he brought me a hundred pieces of candy in a big bag, right? We want what we can't have. I, I have a good friend who is, um, I, I have a good friend who speaks all over the world. He understands and works with people that have same-sex attraction. Heard him at a conference. He was phenomenal. One of the things that he said about boys, girls are a different story. That's something else. He said, boys at puberty become attracted to that which is a mystery to them. We want what they want what they don't know and what they understand. And boys who only grew up around females, they understand females, the girls are all friends, they don't have men in their life, they come to they, they come to puberty and they go, Well, I get girls. What I don't understand is boys. Boys become attracted to what's a mystery to them. We always want what's a mystery. So if we protect and we don't talk about it and we don't explain it and we don't have discussions. That's what our kids want. One of the girls I mentored growing up, she grew up in a Christian household, was told, no, 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 no. That's the first thing she did when she got 18. Went out and got pregnant. And that is followed because she was curious. Because nobody had ever had that discussion with her about what the consequences were. Or, or they, parents wouldn't answer the questions. Students would become attracted to the forbidden and vulnerable to the lies of the world. Connections has to be a place where students can engage with the issues and wrestle with the hard topics. We've got teachers, you want a teacher that blows me away. Everybody, I, I think no child should leave this place without having taken a class from Steve Carrier. Oh yeah. He teaches apologetics and whatever he does. He loves those kids. He's this phenomenal retired older man who loves those kids. My, all my kids have taken his classes and they've changed their relationship with God. He talks about the whys. They ask the questions, and he does it in such a beautiful, sweet way. Um, David Banks, he works with, um, is it Athletes in Action? or is it, Yes, no. Athletes in Action. What? FCA. FCA. He works with the FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. That's the other one. Once a month, he gets the kids together, anybody who wants to come for lunch, and he talks about how to share the gospel. Strong guy who works with the Seahawks. He's the chaplain for the Seahawks. Um, Sid Adler, if you've ever sat in one of her science classes. And there's many, many, many more teachers that, do, that point students to the truth of who they are and the truth of who God is. Connections is a place where the people of Connections experience life together. Everyone's called to be respectful, kind, and considerate. Right? You don't have to agree with what goes on. You do have to be respectful of the statement of faith and beliefs when you're here. You don't have to agree with it. But 
We don't have to agree with other. But you know what we do when we're in a group and we rub up against each other? That helps shape who we are. That's one of the blessings and the best thing about this, about connections. But, here's the but, the seeds of who we are is something that is planted at home. Remember the truth that I said? An institution can't raise your kids for you. Truth. Connections is not the authority. Parents are. Even if your child is telling you differently. It's something I, my, one of my classes I, that I've taught over the years is called Imagine Me. It's three to five year olds. It's a whole bunch of preschoolers. I'm covered in sweat by the end of every day when I teach that class. First time they walk back into the class, the kids run and jump on their parents' lap and they go, and the parents are like listening to me nice and quietly. And the kids are like, and I say, okay, the moment you step back into the room, parent trumps teacher every single time. You have to be the person that tells your kid to be quiet when you come back in the classroom. I can't do it anymore because parent trumps teacher, even if they don't really want to listen to you. I've got kids in here. Um, don't lie to your mama. You really want her and you want her boundaries and you want to, <laughs> you want her, even if you don't pretend, even if you pretend that you don't. We're not a school. You're in charge of your child's education according to the state of Washington. Your teacher has your child for one hour a week. Do you know how many hours you have your child the rest of the week? I looked it up, 167. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> If you are stuck or feeling helpless or frustrated, I can guarantee you that there are hundreds of other moms here that have walked before you and would like to walk beside you. And if you don't, and believe, they love, they, we're all teachers at heart, right? We love to help other people. We hate to see people struggling. And if you don't know who to connect with, go to speak with someone at the welcome table. We have a no parent left mangled in a ditch on the side of the road policy. <laughs> But you have to let us know who you are so we can help you. <laughs> Truth. Now is the time to step up to be the person at Connections who someone else wants to, influ wants to influence their kids. Be that person that another parent can say, man, I'm glad you're spending time with my kid. I get that t I teach preschool three-year-olds all the way through high schoolers. I get that most homeschooling kids are tired of their mamas by the time they reach high school. It's one of the reasons we said, okay, moms, you can, you don't have to, you don't, you can facilitate a class that's not your kids. Because they don't, a lot of times, don't want you in the back of the classroom. They're sick of you. <laughs> and you're probably sick of them too. <laughs> there are many parents and teachers here who have stepped up to be that influence to my children that have both that they've both craved and needed. Elisa Handley, thank you. Thank you for taking my daughter while climbing the other night. That's something I could not do and had not the time to do, and you speak truth to her. Emily Lorelli has done that. There is people who have come upside my daughter and said things to her that I could never say. Well, I could say, but would go like, not listen to. There is those people that have done that for my daughter and I am, and for my other kids, and I am so grateful for that. They help as I begin the process of launching them into the world. But the mentor, be the mentors and the disciplers of each other's children. That is the benefit of relationship. That is the benefit of being here at Connections together. That's what the people do. Are you frustrated about what you see and hear from students? I know some of you are because I hear it. You tell me. Connections, the institution can't solve this, but the people at Connections can. Start by giving some of your time building relationships with students. Then you will have access and influence and be able to speak into their lives. High school students especially, the secret is building relationships with them first. Not so much. The, the middle schoolers, they'll still listen to you. High schoolers, relationship first. You do that, you'll be able to speak truth into their lives. And guess what? There'll be another parent who can speak truth into your child's lives. So I was thinking about what could possibly be a short list of ideas that you could do. 
um, I, I love Lisa Slingstad. She came to me and said, can I start like an art class for free for a second hour? My kid needs, to, needs something to do. She started, we put tables out there, got a whole bunch of donated art supplies, and there's a whole bunch of moms and kids that hang out together second hour. Awesome. I think these moms have become friends and these kids also. I, I'm so appreciative of that. Um, play in band. Do you know you can play in band for free here if you're a parent? It, it doesn't matter if you've never played an instrument before. Robin is amazing with young kids. Sitting beside them as peers, it's a really sneaky way to have influence on kids. Plus, you're going to learn it so much faster than they will because you can like read and move your hands and pay attention all at the same time. <laughs> if you love high schoolers, get involved in a house. Not your own child's house, unless they say that's okay. But get involved in a house, spend time with them. Um, can you help edit a paper or solve a geometry problem or, um, I don't know, teach somebody how to sew or, oh, Joy, stitch a wound. <laughs> give, 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 give uh, take blood, phlebotomy class. Have you got a skill that you're willing to donate one hour of your time? Go to a table, set up a little, the doctor is in or the math teacher's in. It's going to take a little while, put it on the forum, offer to spend time giving of yourself to these kids. I think that you find it's very satisfying to teach somebody else's kid. Number one, they appreciate you a lot more, and they're really thankful, and the parents will be thankful too because you've explained it in a way that they couldn't, and the kid probably gets it, right? Um, bring an indoor or an outdoor game. Play with them outside. Have a really cool board game. Bring it when it's rainy. Just sit down, smack in the middle over there, and say, come play with me. It'll take a little while. It takes a while to build relationships. If some ever grown-up did that to you, another adult for you, you'd look at them sideways. Right? It'll take some time. Be patient. It takes time to build relationships. Returning families, it's time to step out into the community. New families, it's time to step up into the community. Don't wait for each other. Just do it. You are needed. You are valued. You belong here. Let's circle back to the first truth that I mentioned. Our kids are struggling with their identities. I'll tell you the story of a guy named, uh, we'll call him Howard. Howard, I'm not going to give you his real name because some of you probably know him. Howard didn't want to be in a house when we first started <laughs> because my identity is in Christ, not in a house. Well, um, He's a debate kid. My dad was a speech debate teacher. I could probably squashed him <laughs> like a bug. Because <laughs> it was a stupid argument. It really was. Um, but, but I didn't. So I let him talk and asked him, but why? What, what, what is your, because you know, he didn't, I'm like, Did, do, do, do you identify as a, I gave him his last name. What about what college you're going to go to? Are you going to identify? So he didn't get it. It's okay. But he couldn't answer the question, no matter how many times I asked him, what does identity in Christ mean? If I asked you, could you truly explain in layman terms what identity in Christ means? So we are created in the image of God, which means literally the likeness of one subject expressed in another. You have God's stuff in you. And when God created Adam, he put all that masculine and feminine stuff in Adam. Right? It's all, it's, all, it's all equal. It's all wonderful. And then when he created Eve, he took the feminine stuff, what we call the feminine stuff, out of Adam and put it in Eve. We can't know our identity in Christ if we don't know what God is like. If we don't know what God is like, we don't know what we are supposed to be patterning ourselves after. We don't know what the image of God is. If, if you don't know what the answer to what God is like, then you cannot expect your kids to figure out their identity issues either. I live in a 13 square, 100 square foot house with three kids. One of them I'm trying to launch because he's 23 and he, you know, it's too expensive <laughs> for him to leave. I'm trying. And five dogs. If I have been an inductive Bible study my entire life, I wish I could have you all to my house. Because my last study that I wrote was in Psalms. And I went, hmm, I wonder if, I know we can find God in the Psalms, but I wonder if we can find who Jesus is in the Psalms. I wonder if the Holy Spirit shows up in the Psalms. It was one of my favorite Bible studies I ever taught because it showed us who God is. And once you know who God is, you know what we're, he, we were created in the image and the likeness of and we know what our identity is. But more than important than the question of who am I is the answer to the question, whose am I? 
If you cannot answer the second question, you cannot answer the first. When you know whose you are, only then can you become who God created you to be in his image. If you don't know whose you are, but you want to find out, let's have a conversation. I'd love to talk to you about it. It's the foundation upon which everything else in your life pivots. The last truth. God speaks to you. God speaks to who he sees you being, not who you are becoming. Right. Not as we see ourselves. You remember Gideon? My, my uh, team reminded me of this. <laughs> Hiding in terror from the Midianites, hidden, threshing his grain, right? Scared, scared, spitless. And yet God, when he sees Gideon, scared. He doesn't say, oh, well, I'm going to make you brave. Someday, God says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Which at the time, Gideon was not. But God spoke to him as if it was true at that moment. And you know what? Gideon became who God saw him as. I challenge you to speak that way to your children. You will be speaking truth to them. And watch how they become those things you named. One of my best friends, her name is Holly. I watch her. She, she knows my kids really well. Her kids are, we're the same age. Her kids are a little bit older. I'm on the speaker sometimes talking. And she'll start talking to my kids. And she'll start telling them wonderful things about themselves. And I'm going to myself, oh, Holly, you knew what he was really like. But she sees things in him and my kids that I do not. And you know what happens? I see my kids stand up a little straighter and get a little prouder and they start being those things that she's named them. Replace lies with truth. When they say, no one likes me, have your kids ever come home and said that? No one likes me. You say, you are so loved by God. When they say, I'm not special, you say, you are so important to Jesus that Isaiah writes that you are inscribed on the palms of his hands where his scars are. So when he looks at the palms of his hands, he sees you. You are so important. I'm going to leave you with the same challenge a pastor gave our family six years and two weeks ago. I challenge you to pray with your family for 21 days. Oh my gosh, when we started, it was the most awkward thing my family has ever done together. I have walked with Jesus for a little over 50 years. I like praying, but I realized I had never taught my kids really, really how to pray. Oh my gosh, all they did was parrot us and they were older and they didn't have this conversation with God. And it was silly, it became, but eventually it became silly, it became fun, it became not awkward. It became, so they were so eager to do it. We have a thing where it's your birthday, everybody has to pray for you. Do you know how hard it is to play for a sibling or to even pray when you have like are in trouble or the maddest sibling? We did get a few. Oh God, please help my sister to not throw things at me. <laughs> please help my sister to be more mature. Please help my brother. You know, there's a whole bunch of those kinds of prayers too. But that's okay. Leave them. Leave it. It's all right. God gets it. Then at the end of 21 days, I want you to lay your hands on them and bless them. Tell them all the things that you and God love about them. How you and God see them. Pray for their future spouses. Pray for their hopes and dreams. The first time I did this with my kids, I laid my hands on them. And I have grown kids. And I looked up when I was done with the one, and they had come really close to me. And that child didn't want to leave, but the next child was like trying to get close to me. They crave that. Speak truth to our children, your children. It is a gift with eternal significance. Eternal significance. I am so excited for where Connections is going to be this year. I am so excited for what God is going to do. I am so excited about how you're going to step up and you're going to build into lives and we're going to bloom and blossom and our kids are going to be changed forever. I'm going to pray for you and then I'm going to let you go get some dessert and get out of this hot room. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for being the truth. Thank you 
that you clearly state the truth. Thank you that you love the truth. Thank you that no lies ever come from you. Thank you that you created us in your image. And when we know you, we know what, how you see us and how, what we are going to be. Thank you that you love our kids. I pray that you would stir in hearts and minds this year that there would be such a rising of parents in this community and helping each other and loving each other and being with each other. Uh, Father, thank you that though our kids struggle, you understand. Help us to know who, how to pray for them. Help us to know how to pray for our teachers. Help us to know how to pray for those people that are going to speak truth into our kids' lives. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the privilege of being able to lead an, a, a group like this. Ask that you would love these people in tangible ways that they can see this year. I ask that you would bless them, you would bless the year, and you would bless connections. In your precious name, amen. Amen.